Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. <clears throat> Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be <clears throat> mature and complete, not lacking anything. Blessed is the one who preserves under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised those who love him. So be it. And she sanded and painted it by mistake. <laughs> she went to check on it now. I don't know what she's doing. It's not a ham roast. She would tell me differently. It's this pork shoulder that she has to debone and then puts the garlic and rub all inside and then rolls it all up and ties it all neatly. Yeah, it looks very nice and smells yummy. So I can't wait. But I'm going to change the length of my message any because we won't have it till about 1230. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for you are a loving, mighty, awesome God. You are so faithful and so true. Your ways are so much greater than anything that we could ever imagine. And we cling to your words, words that are always true. The fact that Jesus is the word of life. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, help us to feed off of your word, to let it nourish us, to eat it as much as we eat earthly meat, Father. And Lord, just help us to hide it in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Lord, we thank you that you are perfect in every way. And we thank you that Jesus Christ came and lived that perfect, sinless life where he could lay down his life to save us. We are just in awe of you, Lord. Fill our hearts and our, our minds and our souls with your word, Lord. Transform us through your spirit. Tie us together in fellowship with you through your spirit and through each other, Lord. We just pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I titled this, Words to Consider Carefully, because we're up to that portion in Acts chapter 5 where God uses Gamaliel, and I might not have pronounced it correctly, but that's okay, to keep the apostles literally from being killed. But I want you to think, like I said, about the whole story and how things, prog things pr progress and the reason that Jesus said the Holy Spirit would come and greater things that the church would do through Him and how the church has lived, all these things, so that you can see, because it's hard to fathom because we're not persecuted, how that they can have that strong a faith. How that they can be in love with God so much that they wouldn't worry about even their own lives. That they would consider others over themselves. The teachings that Jesus taught and lived. Remember when he was told to sum up everything in the scriptures, he said to love the Lord your God with everything and then love your neighbor as yourself. And John would go on later to write, you know, that how can you love God if you don't love your brothers and sisters, the people that you can see? This world, we, we tend to think about the physical things that we can see, but they all point spiritually to a God who loves us and has created everything to bring glory and honor to Him and for us to shout and proclaim His name. I mean, even where we are in the universe to be able to see the stars and, and everything that we have is because God has placed us right here to see His wonders and His glories. So are you telling your neighbors every chance you get about your faith, about the hope that you have? And we get to this point, like I said, the angel that said, go and preach and teach. And if you didn't notice, and most commentators go there again, that they were released so that they could go back and preach and teach to the people. I don't feel that way that much because, like I said, they, they were wakened there in the middle of the night by an angel. There's no way they could have gone back to sleep. They were talking about that. They get there back in the temple courts where they were arrest, arrested before, and they begin teaching. 
It didn't take long for the Sadducees and the religious leaders to come back and immediately rescue them. They were mad. They were furious. Where did these guys go? And after searching, and, you know, that took a little while, but it didn't take too long because you had to get back and report to your leaders. They said, we heard the guys are back in the same place preaching again. Don't think they tarried. They went and arrested them immediately, but they were worried about what the crowd might do to them. Everybody knows what you went and did, by the way, just saying. <laughs> and they're, they're, they're looking excited for it. You didn't paint it or anything, though, right? You painted the park? Oh, Basting painted it. Okay. So you've got them going back and getting immediately rescued. And the angel said, go to that point and teach and preach the people all the words of life. Well, the people, the crowds, of course, aren't accepting. People are coming from all over the, the, the known world, coming from beyond the borders of Jerusalem to, to hear about these things and to witness the miracles. It's, it's like, you know, we thought Jesus was dead, but he must be there. He must be there at least in the presence of Peter. Even we bring our sick people so that Peter's shadow can fall on them. But was that the intention that God had planned in that little trip that you just made? Think about that in your own lives. Because you think this is the mission, but he's got such bigger plans. They immediately came back and had to stand in front of the Sadducees and the other religious leaders. And they got to proclaim the gospel message again. They would not have got that opportunity like they had unless the angel rescued them to be put right back into harm's way. And this time, harm's way is going to be a lot worse. Are you going to stand firm in your faith? Are you going to proclaim Jesus? Are you, as we see as we get to the end of this chapter, are you going to go away with pure joy, rejoicing that you literally got your skin stripped off of you for proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ? Speak to the people all the words of life. Which life? What life? What are we talking about this? The, the, the apostles are living this life, a life that is sold out to Jesus. We go back and think about Ananias and Sapphira starting this whole section off and everything and God wiping that problem out of the church. But now the testimony has gone so far that men don't fear what men can do. They don't even fear God so much in that aspect because they have that perfect love that casts out all fear. All they want to do is proclaim Jesus Christ, whether it means I'm imprisoned, whether it means that I'm stripped of my skin, and whether it's going to lead to the point or not where I'm going to be martyred for my faith for being a witness for God. I mean, that's a sold-out faith. A genuine faith. A faith that says, I love the Lord my God with everything that I have. And because of that, how can I not love my neighbor, even my neighbor who is my enemy? Back to the story which Jesus told. The Samaritan is the one that helped the Jewish person that was in trouble. He couldn't do anything but have compassion for him. He wasn't being persecuted necessarily for doing it. But the apostles did not care about anything other than proclaiming Jesus. And they knew that not one hair on their head would be harmed unless God intended that. That's exactly what Jesus did. He gave up heaven. He came and lived as a mortal human being, the very creation that He created. To live without the, the things that we chase after, especially in this world, the finer things. He tells when... The, people want to become his disciples that he doesn't even have a place to lay his head and then he let us spit in his face flog him and crucify him unjustly I mean he screams out wait a minute what did this man do to deserve death but it is finished it was made final it was made complete man's redemption is through Jesus Christ there is no other way no other truth no other life and the apostles have to proclaim this because it's God's will that all men come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. This is the life of Jesus. This is the example that we have not only of Jesus, but as His followers living for Him. All the words of life. Not just existing. So many Christians exist, but living a powerful, Spirit-filled life. 
where even Peter's shadow is healing people? Wow. And the religious segment is trying to figure out how are they going to stop this movement. Are you living or are you just existing? Is it a life that you live in community? All of us with the same mindset, with the same thought, being filled with the Spirit, all the body parts working together. I'll remind you of some scriptures. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13, Peter wrote later, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. And they're, they're overjoyed when they get beaten and when they're released to go back and tell the church what happened. But this is a lifelong process so that when you meet Jesus face to face, you can hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. If you, That verse sounds familiar, and it should just from you knowing it, but we read it last week. We also read this verse, Matthew 5, or these verses, 5, 10 through 12. Blessed are those who, persecuted, who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before me. So Peter says, don't be surprised because you participate in the sufferings of Jesus and you will be overjoyed when you see Jesus. And Jesus himself said, blessed, blessed are you, rejoice. Blessed because you're part of the kingdom of heaven. And rejoice, not only be blessed, but rejoice because great is your reward in the kingdom of heaven. If you live a life that glorifies God. If you live a reborn life, born again, where you give up your own desires and wills to follow after the kingdom, to follow after God's will. Later in Matthew 5, Jesus would say, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Maybe this was the one verse that was motivating the apostles that day. Maybe they were praying that, that Gamaliel would be saved, but maybe they didn't see the big picture again and see that his student... Saul, who became Paul, would literally build a church to the utter ends, utter ends of the earth. Right? We don't know the big picture. But we know that right after this again, because you've been in church enough to know that Stephen gets persecuted and Paul is at least there, or Saul is at least there. And you know that he was a student under this, Phar this uh, Pharisee, this rabbi, I don't know if I pronounced it right again, of rabbis. Only a few ever got that title. This was the man that everyone listened to in that day, the man that trained Paul. And he's the one that stands up for defense of the apostles. We don't know his motives. We don't know how much God affected that, the finger of God was on it. But he stood up and stopped them from getting killed that day. Oh, well, great, I got killed, so I get a beating, right? But they counted it as joy, pure joy, that that could happen to them because they got to proclaim the message to the religious leaders and then they got to go back and say, look guys, we're rejoicing in the sufferings of Christ. How would you have responded as a church when they come back? Would you have shrunk down in fear? Would you have said, this job is not necessarily for me? Or would you rejoice in their suffering and been comforted that you might have to suffer also. But you count it as pure joy. Matthew 5, 44 to 45 says, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. To know you've done well, to know you fought the good fight, to know you've thrown off everything that hinders and the sins that so entangly, easily entangle, that you've run the race that was set out before you. I also reminded you of Paul's words in 2 Timothy when he's writing, and he knows these are his last days, and he's not writing to a church, but he's writing to one disciple to not give up because of the persecutions that they're facing. 
Verse 12, and Indeed, all who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil men and impostors go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in the things you have learned and firmly believe. All the words of this life. Since you know from whom you have learned them, from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for instruction, for conviction, for correction, for training in righteousness. Then we've got that again. So that, this is what the, 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 the let's see, let's put it your way. So that when you got all the puzzle pieces and you put them together, you don't necessarily know what the puzzle is until you put the pieces together. That's what that word means in there. It means adequate, perfect, completed so that the man of God may be complete. You might have seen the picture on the outside of the puzzle. You might just have a puzzle where you put it together and you really don't know what it's going to look like when it's, in, when it's done. That's more like what we do. That's faith. But when you know that all the pieces are there, you know that you have the adequate things in front of you to complete the puzzle. And if you wanted to know what the puzzle was at the end then, let's say that the, the end of the puzzle is meeting Jesus face to face and saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. Everything is there. You have everything you need to complete it. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Will you love God with everything that you have and love your neighbor who is even your enemy that who will even persecute you? Will you do that for the name of Jesus and for the sake of the gospel? that men may come to know salvation. In mathematics, that same word is a whole number. It means you don't need to add anything to it. It is complete. And some of your translations say perfect. Fully equipped for every good work. But how can being whipped and beaten and later martyred, how can that be fully equipped for every good work? Think of the testimonies of all the saints who have been persecuted. Think about all your Old Testament stories and the, and the prophets and everything else. That paints a complete puzzle piece when it's done, doesn't it? That their faith was enough to go to the lion's den or to the fiery furnace or to stay in prison or to be persecuted or in Peter to be crucified upside down. I think that spells out that that picture is complete, that you have everything you need to build that puzzle piece, to build that puzzle that the man of God is fully equipped for every good work. The church is. He goes on to say, I charge you in the presence of God of Christ Jesus who will judge the living and the dead in view of His appearing in His kingdom. This is in the next chapter. We read on. Preach the word. Paul gives Timothy a charge and then tells him what to do. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and encourage with every form of patient instruction. For time will come when men will not tolerate sound doctrine. How could the religious leaders again not even simply ask the question, how would you get out of prison? But instead the question is, why did you disobey us? Why did you continue to preach in the name of Jesus Christ? Why did you continue to preach resurrection from the dead? All these things we have commanded you not to, and you continue to do them. So we're to the point where we're enraged, and we want nothing but to murder you. Up comes Gamaliel. <clears throat> Verse 34, But a Pharisee, the religious group that was the enemy of the Sadducees, the ones that they had conflict with, his name was Gamaliel. He was the rabbi of Saul that I told you, a rabbi of all rabbis. Rabban is how you spell that. A teacher of the law who was honored by all, all the people. He stood up in front of the Sanhedrin and ordered, he had enough authority to do that, that the man be put outside for a little while. And that makes you think again, how do we know these words that were next said if the apostles were outside? I'll go back again trying to look at the whole picture and say, it must have been Paul telling Luke about what went on that day because he must have been there. And it must have been burning in him, but he didn't want to do anything about it till he met Jesus face to face. Because we've got the words that were spoken in uh, locked doors. He addressed the Sanhedrin, verse 35. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. 
Now we've got the words coming from the religious leader who is the leader of the, of the religious sects. He is the man to come to for advice. And he says, leave these men alone. What do they do to the men? Well, we believe you, but instead of leaving them alone, we're just not going to murder them today. We're just going to beat them to death. That's not heeding to their advice, is it? When you get so far that you go to get counsel in something that you have a problem with and you know that you've got a problem with it, we'll just use an example of, of uh, lust. I use that a lot because I fought with lust before and I still fight with lust and I'll probably continue to fight with lust. It's just a thing that, that, that God deals with with me. Not that I have a big problem with it. Don't throw stones. I'm just using it so I'm not throwing stones at you. But if I go to counsel for it, if, I put that in there too, I'm not, if I go to counsel for it and say I'm having a problem with this and I go to somebody who I really, really or is an expert in this field or I really value their advice and they say, don't do this. And then I say, I believe you, I understand. But then I don't go do this, but I do this instead. You turn from your evil ways. Be born again. Realize that you're a new creation in Christ and that you have nothing to do with the sinful ways that you used to do, the things that you used to live for. And that the power of God lives inside of you so that you are a different, a new, new creation in Christ where the Holy Spirit can transform you through and through. So they listen to him. Well, we'll read on and, and you'll, you'll see what happens. Consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. They intended to murder them, correct? <clears throat> Some time ago, Thaddeus appeared claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. But he was killed, and all his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led, and that word means to draw to him. He led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed and all his followers were scattered. This is the norm of movements, especially movements that don't have any true part behind them. Therefore, in the present case, I advise, I command, I give you enough wisdom here to make your own decisions, but, but you should listen to me. Consider carefully. Leave. The word is the same as the word led in the one before. Leave. Not draw to, but draw away from these men. Leave these men alone. Have nothing more to do with them. Because if these false movements go to nothing and the people are following them, instead of you standing up and losing credibility with the people, the best thing to do is back off, let it run its course, and if it's not of God, it will turn out to be nothing. And they understand this and believe this. This is wise counsel. He says, let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. Sound counsel, whether it's godly counsel or not. So don't murder them. Leave them alone. But they get a beating instead. So you've got to figure out how that was in God's will and everything else. But look at the motivation factor that it was that the apostles went through this for what the fiery ordeal that Peter would write later that the whole church would go through. We see, say, why is this necessary and everything? But if we look at the whole picture of what God's looking at, maybe we can get a little bit of fathoming. But it's not for us to understand. Where were we when God hung the stars in the sky? You will find, only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech, verse 40, persuaded them. That means that it convinced them that they believed Him. They should have then followed His advice. So they called the apostles in and had them flogged. The exact opposite of the advice that they were given. Again, I'm using my example to that. The reason that I didn't stop this behavior but went here instead of being way over here was because I didn't want my deeds exposed. And isn't that the verdict that was set out in John 3? I know the things that 
are wrong in my life, but I don't want them exposed. I want to hide them away. But Jesus says clearly that they'll be shouted from the rooftop. You're either with me or you're against me. You either love the Lord your God with everything you have or you don't. Now, don't get me wrong. It, the Christian faith is a walk of faith, and it's a process. And that's why Paul says to the church before, I would have loved to give you meat, but I couldn't give you meat because you're still having milk. But you know, it, I, I, I love teaching children at the same time because they don't rationalize like we do. When it says the Bible says this, they say the Bible says this. They don't necessarily comprehend it enough. and You've got a puzzled look on your face, so I'll say it like this. Love your enemy. Oh, well, how am I supposed to do that? Don't build up treasures on earth, okay? But build up treasures in heaven. As an adult, I tend to look here and say, what treasures? How, I'm not really doing this. How did it? And then I even miss the point where it says, build up treasures in heaven. They say it as simple again. Don't. Do. It's pretty simple. We're the ones that want to rationalize it. How can getting flogged help this situation any? I don't know. And I certainly don't want to go through it, and I thank God that I haven't had to go through it. But I'd like to know that if that day comes, that i got enough faith to say whatever is in your will. I won't bow down and worship other gods. Throw me in the fiery furnace. What a testimony to go back to tell the church. And they proclaimed to the religious leaders one last time also. And as we read on, we'll see that many religious leaders did come. The compassion that God has to save all mankind. And the privilege that we have to be a part of it. So we've got to stand firm in our faith. We've got to be united together. We've got to be fully equipped. All the puzzle pieces are there in front of us. We've got to put on the armor of God, not have it just sitting there. We've got to put on every piece. We've got to live holy, righteous lives. We've got the examples of, of those who didn't in the Old Testament. We've got examples all the time. Is your heart being pricked? Their heart was pricked, but their heart was pricked to go murder them. And if they couldn't get away with murder, it was to beat them senseless. And all they were doing was teaching the church to stand firm through persecution. And to count it as joy, let's read on. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Now, I'm going to remind you again what flogging looked like then. More than likely, Jewish law was 40 minus 1. That means 39. That was not Roman law, so if you've been taught before that Jesus was flogged 39 times, there's no proof of that. He could have been flogged 100 times. Romans didn't have any. They, they tormented and persecuted men to death. The reason there was 40 minus 1 for the Jews is you didn't want to turn that man into an animal because he was created in the image of God. At least they have some hope that all men are created in God's image. We don't want them. If you go back to Deuteronomy and look at that, it's so that you don't want them to be considered a beast, that you don't want to whip them to the point of taking their humanity away because we are men created in God's image. Now, there might be the fact that if you went longer than that in whipping that you might have killed someone, yes. But more than likely, because Paul says five times that I have been, be, have been beaten for the gospel, 40 minus 1. It was to get them to quit proclaiming the message, but nothing stopped them from proclaiming the message. In Deuteronomy 25, you will read this. When people have a dispute, they are, they are to take it to court, and the judge will decide the case, acquitting the innocent and condemning the guilty. Oh, how that much irony was right here in that room that day. Because they knew right from wrong, and the gospel, the, the men didn't do wrong. They did not blaspheme. They taught the name of Jesus Christ, and they taught the resurrection of the dead. But I don't want to believe in those things. So I'm not a fair judge. I, I condemn the innocent, not the guilty, but that's just like my Savior. So why should I be surprised? Verse 2, if the guilty person deserves to be beaten, and if you study more, that's not for speech. Okay, Blasphemy, yes, but not speech. 
The judge shall have them lie down and have them flogged in his presence. The number of lashes the crime deserves again. So they might have got whipped once, twice, three times. But to be beaten 39 times, it needed to be pretty severe. Because these men taught a doctrine different than you. And they were already advised by their, their head of their council, leave them alone. But I'm so blind that I don't take the counsel again and I stay in darkness instead of seeing the light. <clears throat> Verse 41 of Acts chapter 5. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing. They were full of cheer. They weren't wavering. They were totally and fully, completely filled, all the puzzle pieces to put together in the fact that they had been whipped for Jesus Christ. And they counted it as pure joy. Not only did they have joy in their heart, but they couldn't keep quiet. They rejoiced, not only with one another, but with all the church and with all the crowds. That they counted it as joy that they had been beaten, they had suffered for the name of Jesus Christ and the gospel. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy. Counted worthy. Not by works of righteousness which I have done, but by grace am I saved. But the works of righteousness that you see shows the genuineness of your faith. And again, I don't want to be whipped. <laughs> I don't want to be martyred for my faith. But I want to know my faith is that strong. Boy, it presents a quandary, doesn't it? <laughs> so shouldn't we live for the moment where we're at today with what we've got and live for everything that we've got and, and cast away all the sins and everything that entangles us and proclaim why we can without being beat or without being martyred? That salvation is found in no other name but Jesus Christ. And that God so loves the world that He gives His only begotten Son that whoever believe, whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. That we have to teach all the words of life. That we have to be one body, one mind, serving, empowered by one Spirit, serving one God, and it's through one Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 42, day after day, it didn't slow them down one bit. Back in the temple courts even, we're not scared of what you can do to us next. And from house to house, being united in fellowship, not worrying about things that are our own, spending time with one another, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming. Teaching what this new way of life looks like in Christ. Teaching all the words of Jesus Christ. Teaching, training up disciples. Not just bringing them to salvation, but training them up so that they won't depart from the ways of the Lord. And proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah, the Anointed One. The One who can take away sins. So here's a thought. Are you eating milk and teaching milk about this life, this church life, about your life? Or are you eating and t getting to the point where you can teach me? Because you have a commission. And the more that you suffer, the more that you're going to either prove that you have that commission or you're going to have an omission because you're going to turn from your faith like so many do. We're not being persecuted like that. Count it a blessing, but also count it as a, as a way to proclaim freely why we're not being persecuted, because every one of you thinks that day might come. We have religious freedoms that could so easily be taken away from us and seem to be heading that way. Make every moment count, not for you, but for Jesus. These are Jesus' words from Matthew chapter 5 is what I'm closing with. And you know that day on the mountainside people did not understand, but we have a little more that we can contemplate and comprehend this now, seeing the, the, the disciples' life in the church. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. 
Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who perse are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kind of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecute the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it may be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and, put, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Father, we do thank you that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We thank you for everything that Jesus has said and done that he expounded upon scriptures so much and, and not just in what he spoke, but in the way that he lived. Lord, help us to consider these blessings that Jesus says that we'll have for following after him. Lord, help us to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow after Jesus, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Lord, we thank you that his work on the cross was finished and that he said that there was no way that he was going to orphan us and leave us alone, that he would send the Holy Spirit to empower us to live this commission that we have, this great commission to take the gospel, to train up disciples, to be a part of reconcili reconciliation between God and man. What a privilege, Father. Help us to stand firm, one another, but even more collectively as this church. We thank you for this church, Lord. We pray that you're, you pour out your spirit on this church and that we are a blessing and a, a proclamation of Jesus Christ in our community and into the utter parts of the earth, Father. We just thank you and praise you. All glory and honor be to you, Father. Your will done and your kingdom come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.